Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I believe all of us can attest to that we've ever done. Can you say amen? Thank you so much, Brother Wingham and the musicians and the praise team and everyone for setting the table for us to receive the word of God tonight. I must admit, I've been waiting all day for this moment. You know, everyone gets to do what they do during the day, and I say, Lord, when is it going to be my chance? When is it going to be my time? And so I'm grateful to be able to come this evening and share the word of God with you tonight. Uh, someone came to me and said, well, I, I watch you on television, and I, I need you to preach this sermon, and I need you to preach that sermon and this sermon. So people start saying all these sermons they want to preach. Well, I've got to preach what God tells me to preach. But I said to them, I said, well, listen, uh, the good thing is I can't preach all the sermons I can't meet. We'll be here for four months. Come on, say amen, and we don't want to be here that long. I said, but in the ABC, Brother Trevor Johnson told us, he said, listen, bring over some DVDs and CDs and whatnot and bring your book and whatnot so what people can't get in the week of camp meeting, he said they can get and they can take home with them. So I said, good. So if Trevor's in here, this is what I'm going to do. Tomorrow at some time, I'm going to go to the ABC. I'm going to sit, shake your hand, sign a book if you buy one, sign a DVD if you buy one. We'll spend some time together. We won't preach all the sermons, but we'll at least talk about them. Is that all right, everybody? All right, praise be to God. So we're looking forward to that time with you tomorrow. We are having a great time. My wife and I and our children are enjoying it. I know my children are enjoying it because they have abandoned me, and they are all over the campground. Amen. And so I know that they're having a good time. In fact, we are in the hotel at night working on our British accents. <laughs> so that when we go back to America, we can be able to sound a little British, you know. Uh, what do you say? Uh, fish and chips. And we don't call it potato chips. We call it crisps. Is, is that right? It, it, what is it? Babe, tea and crumpets? <laughs> uh, you know. I don't know, you know, I don't know, veggie meat, I go back and instead of, we say super link over there, super link, you know, I don't know, you know, but we're having a great time, but I am practicing on my accent because I want to say that I have been to the UK and I have been British, you know, and preachers, you know, we, we get a little creative with the truth, you know, we'll say there were a quarter of a thousand people at prayer meeting, there were just 250 people there, you know. And, and so when I get back to the States, I was in the UK where Harry and uh, Megan are, you know, making people think I saw them, but I'm just here and they're here. What are you saying? But it, it's good to be here to share in God's blessings. Dr. Jose, you and your lovely wife are so kind. We thank God for you. Praise God for you. We're going to get in the word tonight. The scripture was read, but in television, I am used to giving the scripture before I preach because what happens is uh, those that tune in, they tune in and we give them the sermon piece. And so a lot of times when the scripture is read earlier, when we tune in for television time with preaching, they don't hear the scripture. So I'm just used to giving it. So if you indulge me, allow me to read it again. But I also believe that repetition deepens the impression. So the more we say it, the more it sinks in. What do you say, everybody? So if you will, take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Matthew. What book, everybody? Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, and I'm glad my friend is right here. You got that right foot ready? When it's time to stomp, you know what to do. Stomp, all right? All right, let's practice. One, two, three. All right, we're together. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to verse number 23. If you haven't, let me hear you say amen. The word says, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame, his what everybody? Come on, talk to me. His what everybody? Now, it's more of us in here. We're building every night. It's more of you, too many of you not to let me hear you. And his what everybody? Amen. Went throughout all Syria, and they brought him unto him, all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had the palsy. And he did what everybody? Amen. Come on, he did what everybody? And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond Jordan. I didn't tell Brother Wingham what to sing tonight, Wingham what to sing. I didn't tell him what to sing, but it's amazing how God's spirit moves. We never talked about his song, but he sang about falling in love with Jesus. 
Tonight, we're going to talk about Jesus. What do you say, everybody? And we're going to make Jesus famous. God bless us now as we preach your word to your people. May your Holy Spirit fall in this place. And God, may we not just say we've heard another great sermon, but Lord, may we be inspired to be a better people for thee. And we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Now, Lord, I don't know what is going to happen at the appeal time. You already know. I just ask that your spirit fall afresh on us tonight. We praise you and we love you as we seek to make you famous. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say amen, amen. and amen. For Christians, Jesus is the central figure of the Bible. His life is told four times over in the New Testament and four of the Gospels. His life is then told in Matthew and Mark, Luke, and in John. His life was so important that it transformed the entire course of Western civilization. His life has impacted our world so much that either people know, have known, or will know about Jesus Christ. His life is a continuous interplay between the divine and the human. Two natures harmonized, but never completely blended. As man, he got tired. But as God, he said, come unto me, all ye that labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. As a man, he got hungry. But as God, he took two fish and five loaves of bread and fed 5,000 men plus women and children. As man, he got thirsty. But as God, he said, drink of fountains of living waters that shall never run dry again. As man, he prayed. But as God, he answered prayer. As man, he wanted companionship. But as God, he had to tread the wine press alone. As man, he wept at Lazarus' grave. But as God, he resurrected Lazarus from the grave. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God, which means the Word, Jesus, is from the beginning. He is the beginner of the beginning. He is the beginner in whom the beginning began. Because he is the beginning before the beginning was even begun. He is the beginning who did not begin to be because he did not start because he had nowhere to come from. He does not stop because he has no boundary line. He is older than time yet younger than future because he is what he was. So he was what he is and what he was and is he will always be. Jesus was always here, has always been here always will be here, always was, and always is. For even before Abraham was, he said, I am. What do we have here tonight? Jesus, who was born 2,000 years after Abraham, yet he said he was before Abraham. Jesus, who was David's son, was also David's Lord. Jesus, who was Abraham's seed, was also Abraham's Savior. Jesus, who created flesh, became flesh. When God reversed the beginning, when he took a motherless woman from the body of a man in creation, but then turned around and took a fatherless man from the body of a woman in redemption. He's the God-man. Two natures in one personality. He protected the interests of heaven with his divinity, but looked out for the interests of earth in his humanity. In his divinity, he is God's way to man. But in his humanity, he's man's way back on up to God. And when he was on this earth, he went about doing good. His ministries and miracles were not confined to one place or location. But Jesus went everywhere, and everywhere Jesus went, people stood in need of his help. Jesus healed every sickness and disease known to man. There was none too bad, none too hard for my Jesus. And is there anybody here tonight that knows there is nothing that's too hard for my Jesus? With men, things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. In this text, Jesus has just finished overcoming the temptations of Satan. He has just then called the first four of his disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. His earthly ministry is just beginning. His fame is beginning to spread throughout Galilee, and he's just about to preach his sermon on the mount. The text begins in verse number 23. Look at it again. The Bible says, and Jesus went about all what, everybody? Come on, he went about all what, everybody? Galilee. Galilee. All right, so understand, Jesus begins where the people are, Galilee. If you go spread the gospel, you've got to go where the people are. 
You do no good in your house, no good in your closet, no good in secret by yourself trying to spread the gospel. You got to go where the people are. If you're going to go fishing for souls, you got to go where fish are. Jesus said, go ye therefore not come to where I am. Jesus went about all of Galilee. Not some of Galilee, but all of Galilee. Not just to the high and mighty, but also to the least, the last, the lost, the lowly, the unlucky, and the left out. Jesus went to Galilee. Why? There was something about Galilee. Understand that Jesus' earthly parents were from Galilee. Jesus was raised in Galilee. Jesus began his ministry in Galilee. Jesus called the disciples from Galilee. The women who accompanied Jesus were from Galilee. After the resurrection, Jesus met his disciples in Galilee. Galilee was where the people were. The region of Galilee was approximately 70 by 40 miles. History says that Galilee had over 204 cities and villages, each with no fewer than 15,000 inhabitants. Galileans, however, were not highly regarded, but they were looked upon with contempt. Even Nathaniel is quoted as saying, can anything good come out of Nazareth, which is Galilee? When Jesus' ministry was beginning to spread, the people asked in John chapter 7, is this really the prophet? Others said, well, yes, this is the Christ. But still others said, no, it can't be the Christ, for the Christ doesn't come from Galilee, does he? But then the Bible says in verse 23 that Jesus went. Jesus did what, everybody? Went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Now, notice here, let, let me teach you a little bit. Notice here, the verb here is went. Everybody say went one more time. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say went. All right, went here in this text is used in the imperfect tense verb. And when you have the imperfect tense verb, it doesn't mean that it's less than perfect. It just means that it's continuous action, but in the past tense. What am I saying? Matthew is trying to let us know in the text that Jesus was constantly going about. Jesus was constantly going around. Jesus was regularly going to and fro, always ministering to all of Galilee. He never stopped. He was moving all the time. He was trying to touch as many people as possible. A greater portion of our Lord's earthly ministry occurred in Galilee. Here, Matthew describes the commencement of Jesus' Galilean ministry starting out with a bang. It was an instant success. Jesus went about all of Galilee, and the text teaches that he was doing three primary things. Number one, he was teaching. He was doing what, everybody? Number two, he was preaching. He was doing what, everybody? And then number three, he was healing. He was doing what, everybody? Now, let's deal with number one. Number one, he was teaching in the synagogues. Now, the synagogue was the most important institution in the life of any Jew. It's like what the church should be for you and me. This should be the most important institution in your life. Your family is here. Your kids are here. Your friends are here. This is your life. It was no different in those days. The whole of Jewish life centered around the synagogue. The synagogue served as a center of education. Young men would go there in their childhood and they would learn the Talmud. The synagogue was a theological school for training. So this was the center of the whole concentration of Jewish life. And Jesus went there to teach. And when he went there, he would be directly influencing Jewish thought and practice. But not only did he teach, the Bible says he was preaching. He was doing what everybody? He was doing what everybody? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God in the synagogue. Now, let me be clear tonight. Teaching is different than preaching. Nothing wrong with teaching. And yes, I need teaching. Yes, I love teaching. But every now and then, I don't know about you, but I need some preaching. Do I have a witness in this place? I need what's on the printed page to come alive. I need to be stirred up. I need to be fired up. I need to be shaken up. Oh, you don't get it. Let me tell you, some of you have come to camp meeting to be stirred up, to be shaken up, to be fired up. You still don't get it. Let me try it this way. Unless you shake a bottle of orange juice, its concentrate will fall to the bottom. 
and its flavor, its savor, its zest, its essence will flow to the bottom, making its power sweet and watery. When you're given a bottle of medicine, the doctor will tell you, shake it before you take it. We come to church, yes, for teaching, but we also come for preaching. We come to get stirred up because if we don't get stirred up, all of our flavor, all of our savor, all of our zest, all of our energy and enthusiasm will flow to the bottom and there's not going to be too much happening in our churches. I don't know about you, but I come to church to get stirred up. I need the preacher to stir me up. It's my baptized brain that makes me want to shout. It's my sanctified psyche that makes me say glory. Teaching is explanation, but preaching is proclamation. Proclamation means go tell it. That's preaching. Go tell it. Teaching is the careful instructive of relating of content that goes from the mind to the mind. But preaching is the proclamation of content that goes from the soul of the preacher through the mouth of the preacher to the ears of the listeners to penetrate the heart of the hearer. With Jesus, there was never teaching without preaching and preaching without teaching. Jesus did both. Can I give you some good news tonight? Can I preach just for a minute, everybody? Jesus died for you. Jesus rose for you. And Jesus is coming back for you. Your sins are paid for. Your eternal life has been purchased. Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's love. That's love. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head for me. Nah, that's love. That's love. But that's not how the story ends. Because in three days he rose again. That's love. Jesus said, look, I've got good news. I've got a kingdom just for you. I've got a mansion just for you. I've got a prepared place just for you. And eyes have not seen, neither ears heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. First teaching. Second, preaching. And then thirdly, healing. Everybody say healing. healing. Look at the text again, verse 23. He was healing all manner of sickness, all manner of disease among the people. You see, friends, what we have in verse number 23 of Matthew chapter 4 is a one-verse summary of Jesus' entire Galilean ministry. Matthew takes this one verse in Matthew chapter 4, and he expands it in chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, so that these chapters are merely an expansion of verse number 23. In fact, his words in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, prayer, forgiveness, uh, treasure, God, and man are the subjects of chapters 5, 6, and 7. But his works, cleansing the lepers, healing the centurion's servant, healing Peter's mother-in-law, stealing the tempest on the sea, casting out demons, healing the sick of the palsy, healing the woman with the issue of blood, raising Jairus' daughter are the subjects of chapters 8 and 9. So then Matthew in this verse simply introduces the two elements of word and works here. His words, the great sermon on the mount. His works, the mighty works and miracles in chapters 8 and 9. In Jesus' works, Jesus healed everybody. To all that came to Jesus, Jesus healed them. Literally, the verse says in 23 again, and he healed every kind of illness, every kind of disease among the people. Let me read that one more time. Every kind of illness, every kind of disease among the people. Somebody else should have said amen than just this section. Let me try it one more time. He healed every kind of illness, every kind of disease among the people. All right, you still don't get it. Let me try it this way. Physical, he healed it. Social, he healed it. Emotional, he healed it. Economic, he healed it. Mental, he healed it. Spiritual, he healed it. You name it, he healed it. Oh, y'all still don't have it. All right, let me try this way now. One minute, he's a podiatrist. The lame are walking again. 
The next minute, he's an ear, nose, and throat specialist. The dumb are talking again. One minute, he's an audiologist. The deaf are made to hear. The next minute, he's a hematologist, the woman with the issue of blood. One minute, he's an ophthalmologist. He's given sight to the blind. The next minute, he's a cardiologist. He's fixing broken hearts. One minute, he's a dermatologist. Lepers are being healed. The next minute, he's a psychiatrist. He's fixing deranged minds. One minute, he's an anesthesiologist. He's easing the pains of life because all manner of sickness, all manner of disease were healed by him. And so because of this, verse number 24 says, and his fame, his what everybody? Come on, his what everybody? Went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all the people who were sick and taken with diverse disease and torment, possessed with devils, and those who were lunatic, and those that had the palsy. The Bible says he healed them. But notice in the text the three diseases mentioned here. Notice the palsy, which is the greatest weakness of the body. Notice also lunacy, which is the greatest malady of the mind. But then also notice demonic and possession of the devil, demonic possession, which is the greatest misery and calamity of all three. But Jesus... Heal them all. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, y'all don't get it. I'm about to get excited now. Back in the day, back in those days, medicine was not what it is today. Understand, they didn't have x-rays. They didn't have CAT scans. They didn't have chemotherapy. They didn't have radiation treatments. Disease was rampant. Plagues were a problem. Death was all over the place. But the people heard that there was a healer, that there was a bomb in Gilead, that there was a person who could heal them of everything, and this healer would heal everybody of everything. Can you imagine being sick? And knowing there was somebody who could heal you. I mean, you have cancer, but you know somebody can heal you. You have diabetes, but you know somebody can heal you. You can't walk, you can't talk. You have a missing leg, a missing arm. You're blind, but you know that you know that you know that there was somebody who could heal you. And not only could they heal you, but they heal you free of charge. All you had to do was get to that person. You talking about frame. You talking about spreading news fast. All it took was one word, just one touch, just one touch from Jesus, one word from Jesus. Remember, there was a man in the New Testament who came to Jesus and said, Jesus, just say the word. If you just say the word, he'll be healed. Somebody knows. Does anybody know, maybe I should ask in this place tonight, that Jesus can say one word and you can be healed. Somebody knows that you can just say the name of Jesus and Jesus will dispatch from heaven with his healing angel and you shall be healed. That's why I say Jesus, sweetest name I know. Jesus, I've got to tell it everywhere I go. At the name of Jesus, demons fickle. At the name of Jesus, Satan trembles. At the name of Jesus, the sun stands still. At the name of Jesus, donkeys talk. At the name of Jesus, red seas part. At the name of Jesus, lions' mouths are shut. Just a touch from Jesus. Think about that woman with the issue of blood. She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment then I would be made whole. I think that's where we got that song, He Touched Me. He touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. But not only did Jesus heal with one touch, what I love about Jesus is he healed instantaneously. He healed immediately. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He healed at once. It wasn't you are going to get better. It was you are better. It wasn't take this medicine and you'll get better in time. It wasn't take this chemotherapy and in time the cancer cells will go away. It was you are healed. When he healed the blind man, the blind man saw immediately. When he healed the dumb man, the dumb man talked immediately. When he healed the deaf man, the deaf man heard immediately. When he healed the blind man, the blind man, the lame man, these all men, they saw, they heard, they walked immediately. It wasn't any stumbling or mumbling around. It was not process healing. There was never a lingering healing. He healed with one word, one touch, 
and he healed immediately. But not only did he he heal immediately, Jesus healed totally. There was no partial healing. Well, we got most of the cancer cells. I restored your left foot, but your right foot's still missing. I healed your left eye, but your right eye is still blind. No, he healed totally. He healed wholly. But then lastly, I love about Jesus. Jesus healed everybody. No discrimination. No bias. No prejudice. No preference. The Bible says he healed everybody. All manner of sickness. All manner of disease. All manner of illness with one word. One touch. Immediately. Totally. And he healed everybody. He healed the demon possessed. He healed the lunatic. He healed the paralytic. He healed the blind. He healed the lame. He healed the deaf. He healed the dumb. He healed the deranged. Jesus healed them all. And so, verse 25 says, his fame spread. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond Jordan. His fame spread. Multitudes followed him. People came from the north, the south, the east, the west. They came from around the world. They came from every direction. They came to be healed by him. They made him famous. But that was then. This is now. That was first century A.D. But this is now 21st century A.D. But I read somewhere in the Word that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means he's still teaching. He's still preaching. He's still healing. And I've come to make my Jesus famous. So go tell your family, I know that my Redeemer lives. Tell your friends what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Tell your co-workers, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Put it on the internet, Jesus saves. Put it on Twitter, Jesus saves. Put it on Instagram, Jesus saves. Put it on Snapchat, Jesus saves. Make it, no, make Jesus famous. Imagine if you were in Jesus' day. If a family member were terminally ill, you'd take them to see Jesus if you knew without a shadow of a doubt that if you just got your family member in the presence of Jesus, he would heal them. Wouldn't you do everything within your power to get them there? You'd stand in line. You'd wait long hours. If it were snowing, you'd still stay in line. If it were raining, you would still stand in line. You would do whatever it would take to see Jesus. Jesus teaching. Jesus preaching. Jesus healing. The fact that there was no sickness too difficult with Jesus promulgated his fame. He gathered people from everywhere. The Bible says Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, also beyond Jordan. He was made famous. Everybody was talking about Jesus. Today, we gather in large halls. Today, we travel great distances. Today, we stand in long lines. Today, we pay big money to see the famous, the popular, the celebrated, the renowned. If you're a basketball fan, LeBron James, we're there. Oprah Winfrey, we're there. Barack Obama, we're there. Queen Elizabeth, we're there. Harry and Meghan, we're there. Donald Trump, not so much there. <laughs> but we've made the others famous. But when I think about LeBron James, I think about Oprah Winfrey, I think about Barack Obama. I think about Harry. I think about Megan. You know what? They really haven't done a thing for me. But I know somebody who woke me up this morning. 
started me on my way, put food on my table, clothing on my back, made a way out of no way, turned my darkness into day, picked me up out of the miry clay and placed my feet on solid ground to stay. And his name, <laughs> I said his name, I said his name is Jesus. And I've come to the UK to make him famous. He came from the bosom of the father to the bosom of the mother. He put on humanity so that we might put on divinity. He became the son of man that we might become the sons of God. He came from heaven where rivers never freeze, winds never blow, flowers never fade, and nobody's ever sick. In infancy, he started a king. In boyhood, he puzzled a man. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature. He walked upon the billows and hushed the sea to sleep. He healed multitudes without medicine and made no charge for his services. He never wrote a book, yet all the books and the libraries in the world can't hold the books written about him. He never wrote a song, but he's furnished a theme of more songs than songwriters combined. He never founded a college, but yet all schools together cannot boast of how many students he has. He never practiced psychiatry, but he's healed more broken hearts than doctors have healed broken bodies. He never marshaled an army, drafted a soldier, nor fired a gun, yet no leader has made more volunteers who have, under his orders, made rebels stack arms of surrender without a shot being fired. He is the star of astronomy. He is the rock of geology. He is the lion and the lamb of zoology. He's the healer of all diseases. Great men and women have come and gone. Yet Jesus, he lives on. Herod could not kill him. Governments could not silence him. Money could not seduce him. Satan could not seduce him. Death could not destroy him. Hell could not handle him. And the grave could not hold him. He's my Jesus. I said, he's my Jesus. He's my Jesus. And I've come to make him famous. And just like the people back in the day, we got to go today and tell it. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills. And everywhere, tell him Jesus was born. Tell him he was reared in a carpenter shop. Tell him as a child he amazed great preachers. Tell him that he was baptized in the muddy Jordan. Tell him he healed the sick, raised the dead, 5,000 souls he fed. Tell him when you're sick, he healed you. Tell him when you're naked, he clothed you. When you're hungry, he feeds you. When you're down, he picks you up. When you're out, he pulls you back in. Make Jesus famous. Go tell it in the new UK, make him famous. Tell him in England, make him famous. Tell him in Wales, make him famous. Tell him in Scotland, make him famous. Tell him in Ireland, make him famous. Make Jesus famous because he's savior. He's deliverer. He's healer. He's teacher. He's preacher. He's way maker. He's mountain mover. He's heart fixer. Anybody know he's a bill payer? He's a cancer killer. He's a mind regulator. He's a child and marriage savior. Make him famous. And so there I am. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was pastoring there at the time. And I was preaching, make Jesus famous. Go tell it everywhere. And I was there at the Berean church as the pastor of that church, and I was driving through the city of Atlanta. I was driving in a rough neighborhood in Atlanta because I was going where the people were. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I was in a rough neighborhood of Atlanta. We called it Bankhead. Everybody say Bankhead. Come on, say Bankhead. Bankhead was a lot like Brixton area in London. Not the church, but the area. You know what I'm talking about. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Everybody say Brixton. Everybody say Bankhead. There I was. And I was driving my car. And in Bankhead, Britain's Brixton, you lock your door. Jesus will protect you, but you don't tempt God. You lock your door. And I'm driving in Brixton, if you will. And I pull up in my car, and I'm in my car in my Mercedes Benz. Don't hate, celebrate. Come on, say amen. And there I am in my Mercedes Benz with my suit on, my white shirt on, my bow tie on, 
My shoes are on. They're nice and polished. The man of God must represent God. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. There I am in Brixton, and I'm in my car, and I'm driving my car, minding my business, and I pull up to a stoplight, and the stoplight goes red, and I stop. All of a sudden, there's this car that approaches me on my side. And he drives up on his side, and he's playing that bumpity bump, 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 devil music. Come on, say amen. He's playing that music, and that music is so loud. His car is rubbish, but his sound system in his car is worth more than the car. I'm saying, man, go buy some tires. Go by and get some air condition, but he's in that bumpity bump bump car and he's with that loud music. You know the kind of music that is so loud when you stop at a stoplight and somebody's next to you, it's so loud the ground is reverberating. There he is. He pulls up next to me. There I am, the man of God. He's playing his loud music, just loud. All his windows are down. He's got a do-rag on his head. He's got all this stuff around his neck. He's in his car like this. His head is back like that. He drives up to the line and he looks at me and he says, I said, oh no, the man of God is not gonna be outdone today. I'm not feeling this today. I said, oh no, I've gotta make Jesus famous. I looked over in my passenger seat. In the U.S., it's on this side. And I looked over in my passenger seat, and I saw a CD. And it said, Hymns of the Church. I got that CD. I took that CD out of the case. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? I put the CD in my Mercedes-Benz sound system, which was better than his. Hallelujah! I pushed one button. Because in the Mercedes, when you push one button, all the windows come down. I pushed one button, windows came down. Push one button, the sunroof opened up. I put that CD in, it said track number six. I said, I'm gonna give him something good today. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I put the CD in, hit track number six, turned it up as loud as I could. The song came on, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. My system was better than his system. My system drowned out his system. I looked at him, I said, how you like me now? When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. Make Jesus famous. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lambs, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people sheep of his pasture enter into his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise and be thankful i said be thankful be thankful be thankful unto him for the lord is i said the lord is what everybody his mercy is ever what everybody and his truth endure to all what everybody his truth endure to all what everybody Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Make a joyful noise and make him famous. The Lord's my rock. In him we hide. Shelter. Time of storm. The Lord's my light. My salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and foes, came to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and fell. The war should rise up against me in this. Will I be confident one thing that I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
He begged me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy widow, staff, they comfortest me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup. But surely shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Make Jesus famous. Evangelism everywhere, everyone, reclamation, those who have wondered Go make Jesus. What good is it if we come here and we just have a good time about Jesus with just us here? Jesus is calling us to go out there. I see the workers here at this wonderful resort, this wonderful place, convention center, and I'm saying to myself, Lord, how in these next three, four days can we reach these people? Tis so sweet. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the same the Lord Jesus the last stanza. I'm so glad. Come on, everybody. I'm so glad. Oh, for grace, oh, for 
to make you famous and even God right now somebody's testifying testifying of your goodness and Lord when you bless us God when you do something for us you are calling us to go throughout the UK and tell somebody Amen. tell somebody of Jesus teaching Jesus preaching Jesus healing Father, forgive me of my sins right now. There's a man, there's a woman, there's a boy, and there is a girl tonight. That they, Lord, need to trust you. They need to trust Jesus. God, they need to trust you where they can't trace you. So they're here in this place tonight, and Lord, they need to have and make a public acknowledgement of their need for Jesus. And so, Father, I, I need your Holy Ghost right now. I need your presence, your power, right now. Power to make demons tremble. Power to break chains right now. Power to remove addictions right now. Problems that are hangups right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. We need you right now. We need your power to break these challenges and problems we face in life. So, Lord, tonight, Wednesday night here at camp meeting. Lord, by the power of your spirit, I'm going to make an appeal, and your people, Lord, are going to listen to your voice. So, Father, right now, there's a man, there's a woman, there's a boy, there is a girl. They're in this place right now. They may even be watching right now. And, Lord, they need to trust you. They need to make you famous, but before they do that, God, they got to trust you. There's an individual with a situation, a predicament, a challenge, and God, in the name of Jesus... They need to come to the front and give me their hand. But Lord, in their heart, they're acknowledging their need for you. And so, Lord God, right here and right now, I'm, I'm going to go down and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet your people because they're coming tonight. Because, Father, they, they have a desire to meet you and they have a desire to, Lord, surrender their all to you. To trust you. Because they need to make you famous. And Lord, they need to trust you. And then God, I'm asking you to turn their life around. I'm asking you to change them. I'm asking you to change their situation. So that God, they can be a living witness, a living testimony of your power. Lord, do it right here and right now. God, you see your people who are coming. And so I invite you now, you're coming, you're acknowledging, and you're saying, God, I need you, God, I want you. Lord, I need to trust you. I've got a situation. It may be a spiritual situation. It may be a domestic situation. It may be a mental situation. It may be an economic situation, but you've got a situation tonight. You need to trust God because in order for you to make him famous, you gotta first trust him. So tonight, I need you to come. I need you to come. I need you to come. God is calling you right now. We're pausing this prayer. You're coming. Lord, I trust you. God, I believe you. Lord, I don't see it. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm believing you for it. I'm trusting you for it. Man, woman, boy, girl, that's appeal number one. Appeal number two, there, there's someone who's here at camp meeting. Yes, you want to trust God and you need to trust God, but you need to take it a little step further. You've come to camp meeting because you came, you need something spiritual. You need spiritual victory. You need victory over a challenge. You need victory over somebody. You need victory over something. You might even need victory over yourself. 
You want to trust him. You want to make him famous, but you want to go a step further. And you need to renew your commitment to the Lord through baptism. You need to renew your commitment through re-baptism. On Sabbath, we're going to have one here. And God has spoken to you, and you know you need to strengthen your walk. Maybe you're here at camp meeting, and this is your last-ditch effort to, to fully surrender. And you're saying, Lord, you've got to speak to me during this period. You've got to speak to me during this encampment because I feel like throwing in the towel. I think of raising my hands and letting it go. The church thing, the God thing, the Jesus thing, I'm done. But God allowed you to come to camp meeting because he's trying to save you through this effort. And so God has spoken to you tonight and you're saying, I want rebaptism. I need to renew my commitment. I want you to come stand right next to me. Don't be afraid. Don't worry about people. This is a no questions asked baptism. This is a commitment you're making between you and the Lord. You're renewing your commitment to rebaptism or making that first commitment for baptism. Jesus, Jesus, sing that now. Jesus. You're here. Jesus, God bless you. God bless you. Trust him and how I prove Jesus, 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 precious Jesus, oh, oh, for grace to trust him more. One more time, the course. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him and how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for trust him more. Last night our appeal was Lord deliver us. Our prayer was Lord deliver us. Our prayer was Lord even our children. Our grandchildren God delivered. That was last night's prayer deliverance and we remind you that deliverance is still available to you. But tonight, we got to make him famous. The enemies of God are stepping up their game. The people of God cannot be silent. If the enemies of God are going to do their thing, then the people of God must do their thing. But too many of us, instead of standing on the promises, we're sitting on the premises. But God is calling us tonight to trust him. To live our lives for him and then go tell somebody. Make him famous that he's a teacher, he's a preacher, and he is a healer. Tonight, before I pray and close this prayer, I, I want you to know for the individuals who come down tonight, the individuals who are even standing still at their seat, I'm a witness God can heal you of anything. There's somebody tonight that needs healing. You've got cancer, you need healing. There's somebody tonight, you've got high blood pressure, you need healing. You've got arthritis, you need healing. There's somebody tonight who's suffering from depression. In the name of Jesus, be healed. There's somebody who needs to be healed financially. Your expenses are greater than your income. You need financial healing. Somebody, you need emotional healing. But we all need spiritual healing. That's why we're at camp meeting. Heal us. For those that have come to baptism, I, I want to touch you. I want to touch and agree. I want to hold your hand. So if you've come down for baptism tonight, I just, I just want to touch you. I just want to touch you. I just want to hold you. You just come, come to me. Come to me. Don't be afraid. Just come to me. Come to me. For those that need special prayer, even after I have finished this prayer, there are intercessors here at camp meeting that will pray with you and pray for you. The word of God says that this place should be a house of prayer for all people. Oh, Lord, thank you for having your way again tonight. Last night, we asked for deliverance. Tonight, we want to trust you, and we want to make you famous. So be with everyone who has come down to the front tonight. Lord, you know the situation they're dealing with. You know what they're dealing with. You know who they're dealing with. And the devil, the devil and his imps, 
Lord, more than anything, they are trying to take hold of the individuals that stand in front of me tonight. But God, we claim the promise, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. And if there's a greater than, there must be a less than. So God, you're greater than. Your grace is greater than all of our sins. So in the name of Jesus, seal the decisions of the people who've come down tonight. I pray that God, you would cover them, that you would protect them, keep them. And let them know that you're there, that they can trust you. It's okay. You're there. And then, God, may we all make a commitment tonight that after you have brought us through, because you don't take us to anything you can't bring us through. After you have brought us through, God, we promise you tonight that we will make you famous. That we will go tell people about the fact that we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Lord, you're good. Thank you for being good good you're good you're better to us than we've been to ourselves and so because you're good we close this prayer in the name of the great teacher the name of the great preacher the name of the great healer in the name of Jesus we pray let everyone say amen and amen. Come on, praise God all in this building tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. As we return to our seats, those that need special prayer, the intercessors are here. Those for baptism to my right, your left. You can meet here. The pastors are here. Lord, you are good. Yes, you are good. Lord, you are good. You've been better than good. I can't praise you enough. Even I owe you my life. Can't praise you enough. Even if I try, Lord, you've been so good. Let's sing it, everybody. Lord, you are good. Come on now. Lord, you are good. You've been so good. Lord, you are good. You've been better than good. I can praise you enough. I owe you my life. Can praise you enough. Even if I try, cause